Hi, Daniel, how are you doing? Um, okay, great. Hi, everyone. We're going to kind of let people come in as they come in. Um, and for those who miss a little bit, the, this recording will be available. So I just want to say welcome to everyone to today's webinar by the Social Impact Measurement Topical Interest Group of the American Evaluation Association. It's a little bit of a mouthful, so we call it the SIMTIG. <laughs> That's how I'll call it. Um, I'm Sasha Zova, and I'm a co-program chair of the SIMTIG board. And for those of you who are not familiar with it, the American Evaluation Association is a professional association of evaluators. Um, and we have approximately 6,000 members representing 50 states in the US and actually in 80 foreign countries. And I will drop a link to it um, in the chat. The SIMTIG is a subgroup of the AA members. And it's for members who are interested specifically in the topic of social impact management, exploring the interplay of social and financial return on investments. So we look mostly at organizations that are looking for financial return as well as a social um, or environmental one. So impact investing is clearly uh, kind of a very big topic for us. We come from many bit different backgrounds. So from evaluators to evaluation commissioners, corporate, nonprofit, uh, private sector, uh, from uh, investors to investees. And then if you're a member of our TIG, it just means that you want to learn more about evaluating the impact of organizations that are aim aiming to produce a, um, a social impact along with a financial return. And we are always welcoming new members and we will be looking for more board members as well to help out at the end of the year. So I'll drop another link in the chat um, that, that give, uh, gives you a little bit more information about the AA, AA SIMTIG um, and how you can join. Uh, today's webinar is our third in the 2022 webinar series. Uh, we will have more as, as the, the year goes on. And all of our webinars are kind of completing around the, um, the AA conference te uh, theme, reshaping evaluation together. Um, the, the theme really links three sub themes of data equity and new actors and is looking at um, shifts that are disrupting evaluation practice today. So it's gonna be a very interesting conference. Um, Heather will mention it um, as well. And we'll discuss all of these aspects today. In the past month, uh, Heather, who is the co-chair of the uh, co-program chair of the uh, SIMTIG board, um, and I, along with others on the SIMTIG and a lot of SIMTIG volunteers, have been busy selecting proposals for the conference, planning uh, planning the webinars, including this one, and preparing the blogs for the SIMTIG series in July. So we hope you will all um, uh, review the blogs and come to the conference. And, and also, we want to say a big thank you to those of you uh, who contributed. Um, as the year goes on, please do keep in, uh, get in touch if you have a topic that you would like to discuss either at one of these webinars or on the blog. Um, at this point, it's probably going to be 2023 uh, when we'll be able to feature it, but we're always collecting new topics. There are, there's always interesting conversation that happens. Um, now I will turn it over to Heather, as I said, my co-program chair, and she'll introduce the webinar and then introduce our presenters. Great. Thank you, Sasha. Hi, everyone. I'm Heather Esper. I lead the performance measurement and improvement um, team at the William Davidson Institute at the University of Michigan. And I second Sasha in welcoming you to our webinar series. We have a very exciting webinar today focused on how ventures can navigate opportunities and constraints in measuring and managing impact, as well as adapting their M&E approaches to dynamic market-based contexts, and as well as responding to reporting demands from their investors. I'm going to introduce you to the host in a minute, but before we dive in, I did want to say that this is one in a series of webinars, as Sasha mentioned. All our, our webinars are recorded, and you can find them either on the AA SimTag website or on our YouTube channel called AA SimTag Webinars. Um, put the link in the chat so you can check that out when you have some time. And then the next webinar that we're going to have is will be on September 20th at 11 a.m. Eastern. We're going to take a little break for summer. We know people's schedules get a little bit um, difficult to meet needs during the summer with vacation. So September 20th at 11 a.m. And it will be presented by Mike McCrellis from Impact Frontiers and focus on Impact Investing 101. So please mark your calendars and stay tuned for more details. I'm also going to pop the link for that into the chat. You can register and get on your calendar for the fall. All of our webinars this year are linked to the social are linked to social impact measurement, obviously, but they're also linked to this year's AA conference theme, which is reshaping evaluation together. 
It's focused on three themes. One is equity, social justice, and decolonization. The second is new funders and social finance. And the third is digital data and technology. We're excited the conference is gonna be in person in New Orleans, November 7th through 12th. And now without further ado, I'll introduce you to today's webinar. We're very lucky to have with us Karim from the Oxford Impact Measurement Program. He is also one of the co-creators of the SimTig, so the original. Uh, we also have Laura, who's an independent consultant and who is also currently serving on the SimTig leadership team. And we have Penny, who is with Creative Evaluation. Unfortunately, Heather couldn't join us, but she's from Royal Roads University. So in this webinar, Karim, Laura, and Penny will describe four phases of Ventures Impact Journeys, orienting, navigating, sailing, and tacking, and the key questions, priorities, and challenges associated with each one. They will then share concrete um, tools that evaluators can use to help ventures align their measurement to the phase they're in and to the question at hand. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to their team. Thank you, Heather. Good morning, everyone. Greetings from New Zealand, Kia ora, um, where it's uh, just before dawn. So um, early morn, early winter morning here. So we're very pleased to be able to present this work to you uh, today and particularly to um, a group of uh, evaluators and, and possibly others. So we have got here um, what I would describe as a dream team. So I work uh, as an independent consultant and I've been in evaluation for, um, for around 30 years, I would say. Um, and I have to say, this is one of the best teams I've ever worked with. So, um, so I'm really pleased to be able to present the work that we've done together over the last um, year or so. So I'll hand over to the team to just say a few words about um, themselves. So uh, Karim, would you like to start? Sure, I'll just, I'll keep it short. Nice to see a lot of familiar faces and, and some new ones. So I'm Karim and, you know, as Heather said, uh, had a longstanding involvement with the SimTig um, and have tried to operate at this intersection of evaluation and uh, market-based approaches, including impact investing and social enterprise, which we're gonna talk to you about today. Laura? Hi everyone, I'm Laura Bedzina. Um, I am also an independent consultant in impact measurement and management. So excited to be a bridge um, between the evaluation field and a lot of the exciting stuff that's going out there in, in impact finance and social entrepreneurship um, and what a great project to be able to do it with. Okay, so just quickly to give you an idea of what we're going to be covering today, um, we'll start out with a bit of a backstory. How did we get to this? Why, why did we um, produce this? We were lucky enough to have the opportunity to do it through some work we're doing with an impact investing fund. So Karim in a moment will give you um, the background to that. We'll then move on to describing for you the, the phases uh, that we have discovered and worked through uh, of the impact creation journey. And then the guide, guidance that we've produced and what that looks like, we'll get into that in some detail. We'll provide a demonstration and, and how the guide can be used. And then, you know, reframing impact measurement and management and what that means for evaluators. So what kinds of roles can we play as evaluators in this field um, and, and bring value to it? Thanks. All right, thank you. Um, so we'll give you a, the, the short version of the origin story so we can get into the demo and, and some of what we found. Um, but there were a number of intersecting threads with our work and, and particularly Penny and I, um, as she just mentioned, had been working on one hand with this impact fund, which we think um, was the first developmental evaluation of its kind applied to, to impact investing about five years ago. And so we've had this kind of longstanding engagement with an impact investing fund that has been looking at um, how to deploy capital to tech solutions to create uh, transparency in supply chains to think about how to protect uh, the rights of workers and to think about um, where the, the kind of worst instances of exploitation could be avoided within corporate supply chains. So quite an, an ambitious endeavor, even within impact investing. Um, and one of the distinctive features of, of this developmental evaluation was 
what is the role of, of the evaluation toolkit, as it were, and some of our training and experiences that for many of us essentially have their roots in the nonprofit sector, public sector, philanthropy, and aren't always obvious in terms of how they're set up for market-based approaches. On the other hand, particularly over the last five years, there's been this increasing growth and trajectory around what we now call impact measurement and management. Um, the SIMTIG, I think, is one representation of that, where in early days, there was a, really a handful of us, and that has grown quite significantly within the evaluation space. And then, you know, these parallel threads of us trying to test some of these issues around how do we bring the evaluation toolkit to a quite new deployment of what impact investing was trying to do around worker rights and labor rights. And at the same time, think about how, uh, what, what else was, was, was not yet in place, um, particularly the adaptation of some of the tools and practices that we might be familiar with in different contexts and more programmatic contexts and trying to apply that to a market-based um, setting. One of the original kind of um, thoughts when we were confronting with our work was as we were working with this portfolio of early stage ventures through the Working Capital Supply Chain Innovation Fund, we might have expected that as these ventures got funded and grew, essentially the needs and demands around impact data, impact practice, et cetera, would just grow as they scaled, you know, in, in sort of a linear fashion, essentially you would start having, let's say, even higher level th you know, theory of change, and then increasingly get more sophisticated around metrics and tools, et cetera. Um, it was initially our experience that that journey wasn't as linear. Um, and so we began probing around that a little bit more in, in the work that we did with these ventures, but also had heard similar things from outside of this portfolio they were working with. And so that was one of the, the kind of roots of this project was, as what is the venture journey and, and what does it look like as ventures grow, evolve, scale? And how do we um, as evaluators, as practitioners, but also as investors that are keen to support ventures to get more value from IMM respond to that? And then selfishly, um, the four of us have been doing this kind of work in almost like a hybrid domain for, for a while. And, and we wanted to create, uh, or we were seeking, uh, I guess, a kind of guide that had a range of the tools and practices that we might have more easily deployed in the public and philanthropic setting, but didn't yet exist in, in a market-based setting. So those are some of the threads that came together. Um, and as Laura will explain, both within the portfolio of working capital and then subsequently outside of uh, you know, the, the DE, we heard that ventures went through just a very interesting set of journeys around how they confronted and navigated IMM. And so the starting point for us was to begin to tell that story. Okay, Laura, over to you. Thanks, Karim. So let's anchor this conversation in the voices of the ventures, some of the ventures that we spoke with. And I'll start by reading a couple of snippets from some of the interviews that we conducted with ventures who had had some experience with IMM, who had gone through different, uh, different phases and who were reflecting a little bit on their journeys. So I'll start with a story from Sabrina Habib from Kidogo. She described um, an experience with a very intensive uh, case controlled study that happened just six months into the existence of her venture. We were still in prototyping phase and iterating, but the research required things to stay stagnant so that we could measure the change over time. Our model stalled for two years because we couldn't change anything. At times, it might be more important to prioritize iteration and innovation than it is to prioritize research. I'll name another quote from Emily Cunningham of True Moringa and talking about their experience using a standardized uh, measurement tool that they were recommended. Ultimately, we rarely made data-driven program or policy changes based on the PPI tool. Uh, the PPI data we collected. And it was a really big undertaking to organize our field officers to go to remote areas to ask questions that those being surveyed did not really see the relevance of. They're like, I just wanna sell you my seeds. Why are you asking me about my refrigerator? And then finally, a reflection from Astrid Chang from Provenance, uh, which is one of the, the companies in the working capital portfolio. What you measure does change over time because ventures are such early stage entities. Their product is just forming. Their understanding of the market pain to be filled is just forming. And as I've learned is ever changing. 
So that iteration and trying to find product market fit constantly changes. Therefore, what you think the impact may be will change in six months time, in 12 months time, in 24 months time. So interestingly, all three of these ventures are describing pain points they had kind of come up against. They had been given some kind of conventional wisdom about how they should be approaching their impact measurement and management. And each of them tried it and then ended up pushing back against it. Luckily, each of those stories actually has a happy ending. Um, so in Sabrina's case, once they were done with that case controlled trial, they were actually able to break free, move on and start to use IMM that was much more nimble, asking the questions that were most relevant to the moment and allowing them to very quickly iterate. Um, and they grew really rapidly as soon as that research study was over. Um, in the case of True Moringa, they ditched the PBI tool. Um, they started measuring um, income of the farmers they were working with much more directly and much more compellingly. Um, and so they, they were throwing out that conventional wisdom as well. Um, and then Astrid Chang actually was one of the ventures who worked closely with Penny and Karim's team to actually work to evolve the metrics that they were measuring. And they were able to negotiate that with their investor who was able to be flexible because as their business model changed what they were measuring should change as well. So the, the core insight we kept hearing from the ventures we were speaking to was this. Um, and it started, to, it started to get us to think about this metaphor of a sailor out in the ocean in a little boat. And as conditions change, sailors adjust their sails and direction. They increase or decrease their speed. They drop anchor. Maybe they change their route altogether. And Critically, a technique that is right for one phase of the journey will be wrong or possibly even harmful at a different phase. The autonomy to act and adapt is critical. So this was the key insight and spirit that we wanted to, to really hold at the center of whatever we created as we continue to learn from ventures. So from there, as we heard more and more stories from different ventures who were describing different kind of phases and moments and choices that they made over the course of their impact journey, we were able to tease out these four different phases. And I'll describe them in more detail in a moment, but um, we, we were able to, to separate them out into these categories of orienting, navigating, sailing, and tacking. And I want to make a couple of things really clear up front. First of all, this is not the same thing as a scaling journey. We're talking about the impact creation journey. This is the journey that ventures go through as they try to get closer and closer to the, the goal, the mission that they were set out to, to do and getting better and better at creating the impact they tried to create. So it's not exactly, sometimes it aligns and matches up with a scaling journey with those kind of traditional phases you may have seen, but um, we're not, um, it's not the same thing. The second thing uh, that I want to point out is that this is actually not a linear journey. So while we sometimes saw uh, ventures go through these four phases in this particular order, starting with orienting, then into navigating, then into sailing and tacking, we also saw examples of navigating, sailing, navigating, sailing, or sailing, orienting, tacking, orienting, sailing. So sometimes ventures pass through the same phases over and over again. Um, they kind of doubled back on themselves. It's a non-linear, iterative, adaptive experience that was described to us and that we've tried to capture here. So going a little bit deeper into what each of these phases means. Orienting, we describe as an intentional, defined moment of framing and goal setting. And this will be familiar to the evaluators in the room, anyone who's taken the time to sit down and develop a theory of change, for example. That's a moment of orienting. It could happen early in the venture's journey, but it could also happen later on. It could happen at kind of a strategic retreat. Um, it could happen at sort of a critical existential moment where they need to make a, a change or decision. So an orienting, it's the, the really the, the, the key thing here is that it's a critical pause um, to, to reflect on goals and direction. Um, another, the second phase that we explored was this navigating phase. And the, the mood or the mode of this one is really one of exploration and testing and trying to, um, you know, maybe a lot of assumptions were, were set out when the venture was first created. This is an attempt to validate or invalidate a lot of those assumptions. Sometimes this looks like 
trying to get really, really uh, rapid feedback from your customers or talking uh, really very kind of high touch um, or trying a lot of different strategies for, um, for creating impact and also for measuring that impact. Sailing is a mode or a phase. Um, we, we almost uh, used the word streamlining to describe this phase. It's a continuous period of moving and managing toward a streamlined and optimized set of goals. So almost like at this point, the venture is a bit on autopilot um, and able to, to optimize and really focus. And then finally, tacking. Tacking, we heard different examples of um, a, a specific time-limited pivot or an adaptation either to a new opportunity or a new challenge. So sometimes in parallel with the core product or service, a, um, a company might decide to develop a new product, and kind of test it on the side. Or there might be a new partnership opportunity or a new shock, like a pandemic, where they have to test something brand new really rapidly and do a kind of deep dive study to understand that. So those are the four different phases. And again, they don't always happen in that order and they don't always just happen once. I'll show you how this plays out in practice. So going back to the example of Kidogo, Kidogo is a, um, we told the story of the case controlled study that had kind of hampered their growth in the early days. Um, they are an early childcare provider in Kenya. And once they were <laughs> free from the shackles of that particular study um, that, by the way, they were asked to do by a funder, kind of came as a requirement of a grant they received, um, which will not surprise many of us in the room, um, they were able to experiment. And so just I'll, I'll show you an example of a couple of the questions they asked during different phases that they passed through. When they were in a navigating phase, one of the top top of mind questions was how do the parents, our customers, how are they experiencing the services we're providing? We just wanna get a lot of their feedback. We wanna understand what their user journey is like, what their needs are, are we meeting their needs? Um, and this was important because at the time, Kidogo was still developing their core offering, learning about their customers and trying to find the right product market fit. Now, as they grew and as they started to kind of get better and better about what they were offering, they started asking different kinds of questions. The questions shifted away from what do the parents think? They, they were able to kind of know at this point what parents thought. And instead they're asking, you know, our teacher training is really long. How, can we sh how much can we shorten that teacher training while preserving the same level of quality and the same kind of outcomes that we're achieving? So at this point, they have a stable business model. They have more streamlined operations. They're seeking expansion. And so the questions they're answering, they're trying to ask are shifting more to like, what's my impact bang for the buck? Like, how can I lower cost and maintain impact? Which is another critical question, just appropriate to a different phase. So, the, the core insight from hearing about all of these different ventures and their experiences when they were, um, when they were happy with their IMM and when they were unhappy with their IMM really got, came down to this for us. When ventures align their IMM approach with the phase they are in and with the questions at hand, IMM drives impact creation. When there is misalignment, IMM hinders impact creation. And we saw examples of this over and over. Because um, for example, maybe a venture might be, might have an IMM system that is in a sailing mode. So maybe they're kind of optimizing for just a few KPIs and maybe they're optimizing for the wrong KPIs because they never went through an orienting process to actually select those KPIs. Or they didn't test a lot of those assumptions during a navigating period. So they're sailing when they should be navigating, for example. The same can happen in reverse. Maybe you have a really hefty, high touch navigating style IMM system, but you're kind of past that. You've already answered those questions and you're, the questions you're answering should, should shift to a more streamlined, optimized version. So you're in that case, navigating when you should be sailing. So we saw a lot of examples of misalignment often influenced by expectations, norms, and yes, demands of investors and funders. Okay, thanks, Laura. Um, so we tried to give you a bit of a, a flavor of, of not only what those phases are, but as Laura explained, you can begin to get some of the implications for, for what it means for, for folks like us. Because, you know, on one hand, sometimes we are, are working directly on behalf of investors um, and are trying to essentially um, reflect their preferences, questions, which, as Laura said, may not always be 
the same and perhaps even misaligned with, with the ventures. On the other hand, sometimes many of us also work directly with ventures and they are trying to respond to either current or prospective investors. And that's really why right in the title, we, we've got both of those framings in place. And as we'll show you, uh, the way that we've structured the entire guide is trying to uh, set the conditions for a different kind of conversation and interaction than the ones we typically observe that we think are what would be important and necessary to be able to create the autonomy and adaptability that um, Laura talked about. So right in the title, when we talk about ventures at the helm, which we'll um, elaborate on shortly, but the subtitle Ryan, how ventures and investors navigate the journey together is really the, the kind of focus of how we structured this entire guide because ventures are our primary focus. As Laura said, we've tried to tell their story and we came up with the framework and many of the um, guidance in a fairly inductive manner around what are the questions, how are they making choices and what do we think the implications are? We also think that investors um, are trying to do this differently and better. Um, and many of them are looking for particularly guidance around managing for impact or impact management, because the guidance around measurement has tended to focus around things like some of the classic tools, like theories of change, but also a very standards heavy conversation. It doesn't always tell you enough around how do you manage actively for impact and what's the role of an investor in promoting um, more impact on behalf of their portfolio and, and ventures. And then importantly for, for us um, and this group, as evaluators and practitioners, we often are in the middle, trying to either translate, mediate, um, support the, the journey and how to promote better practice, because we're really in the early stages of what a, let's call it a professionalized version um, and, and field around IMM looks like. And, and I think even if you reflect on the evolution of the TIG and, and the webinars over the last five years, um, that has accelerated quite a bit. So in that vein, we're hoping that we can contribute um, some new insights and tools. and. We tried to pack a lot in, um, in the 70 pages. Uh, we gave you a bit of a preview into some of the phases. Um, we will demo um, some of the worksheets, um, but we also won't have time to go through all the worksheets, but you can see that there are worksheets both for ventures as well as investors. Um, and we have some of our own um, reflections, which we'll touch on um, towards the end of, of the session, because we think that these raise some important and perhaps very timely questions for the role of evaluators in promoting um, different ways of practicing IMM um, and consistent with the themes that um, we heard about earlier. And so for each of the, the phases, um, there's a lot to unpack here. Um, we do talk about, as Laura was explaining, what it looks and feels like from the venture perspective, the critical IMM questions that the venture has to address, the range of factors, influences, and inflection points that we heard from ventures based on their journey. So we try to catalog those from the range of different organizations that we spoke with. And then we provide some examples of tools, approaches, and methods that would be familiar to many of you that we think um, are appropriate for those specific stages. And um, we'll get into this shortly, but part of the challenge here is that some of the tools might be familiar to you, but you might have seen them being deployed in phases that were actually not suited for, for them. And that, that's really part of, as, as Laura said, the message we're trying to drive home. We describe some of the common pitfalls and how to do this well, and we think that's particularly helpful guidance, both for ventures and investors. We also have a section around how investors can help and support. And then towards the end of that document, we also have a quite explicit list of ways we think investors can perhaps show up a bit differently in supporting the venture journey and also to promote just better practice as we think about field building. Um, and we feature cases for each of the phases as Laura has for, for Kidogo. And just very quickly on the investor side, and happy to take some questions on this later, um, if you'd like, we highlight four broad ways in which investors can support ventures through their journey. It really begins by being clear about what their own expectations are around IMM um, in order to avoid some of the misalignment that we heard perhaps um, occurs way too often. We also have seen and know that investors can and do provide both direct financial and technical support, as well as facilitating that indirectly through procurement of expertise and, and technical um, elements. We also think that there are a range of behavioral aspects around the relationship between ventures and investors 
that are not always conducive to an open and mutually beneficial conversation around IMM. And so we provide some guidance around how that perhaps can be um, adjusted in a way that suits both parties rather than feeling like it's confrontational or that it's um, even occasionally painful. And then we also have seen lots of good examples where investors are stepping up saying, part of our contribution as investors is to essentially demonstrate that IMM can provide value. We wanna be more transparent and there are ways for us to essentially contribute to field building in this area. And at least some of you um, have either worked um, for those kinds of investors or are part of those teams. And that I think is part of our broader hope in that many of the impact investors that are making commitments to IMM and doing it better, essentially um, not only think about the tools and practices that are appropriate, but also the behavioral, political, and cultural aspects that are required to do this well. So why don't I hand it over to Laura to actually now take us back into um, some of the demonstration around how we converted some of the findings into practical guidance, um, particularly for, for ventures as well as investors. Thanks so much, Krim. So I'll kind of preface this by saying, you know, this is a new tool in the world. And we can, what we're gonna walk you through is how we think it can be used, how we hope it might be used. Um, and it's, it's just one scenario that we'll walk you through today. We'll say just a couple of others, but we are so excited and curious to see how this can kind of be taken on the road, especially by, by folks like you, by the people, people like us who are kind of in the middle, who are playing this mediator role. So um, we tried to anticipate the ways that we ourselves might use it. Um, and so that's the tool we built. Um, and so we'll walk you through a scenario where to get a sense of, of how you, you might try it as well. But we're also really curious to hear from you how this might show up in your work. So um, we'll start out with a scenario that's familiar uh, to the folks on our team, hired by an impact investor to provide technical assistance on IMM to the ventures in the portfolio. And we're finding that one or more of the ventures we're working with is actually struggling with the reporting requirements that the investor has placed on them, especially because they've gone through a lot of change in the last couple of years. And so the metrics they initially committed to as part of their covenant, their agreement with their investor are just not feeling so relevant. So how can this guide help? Well, this approach we suggest is not necessarily to read the guide, you know, page one to page 70, but rather to kind of jump around um, and take different pieces as they are useful. So uh, the overarching approach is first to help the venture identify the phase they're in right now. So first is like figure out where you are. Second is to diagnose whether the IMM practices they are currently using and that maybe the investor has asked them to use are actually in line with that phase or not. So a sort of self-assessment of are you in alignment or not? And then third, if not, help them advocate for better aligned IMM with the investor. This is that facilitative mediator role. And so I'll show you how different parts of the toolkit might help you take those three steps. So uh, we have a bunch of worksheets in this toolkit really designed to, to simplify some of the, the really dense stuff that, that's in there. So uh, the first worksheet we have for ventures is just um, a tool to help find your phase. And I've just done a couple of screenshots and excerpts from this worksheet, but you can download the whole thing with the link I've posted in the chat. So the first thing is that the, um, the venture can reflect alone or along with the practitioner um, on some of the most critical questions they feel are, are really important for their venture to answer right now. Not like a year from now, not eventually, but like what is, what is really mission critical at this moment? And so you see that this um, imaginary venture has selected a lot of questions that we've put in the navigating category. Questions like how effective is our product or service? What do our customers think? Uh, which of our original hypotheses and assumptions hold? Which ones were wrong? They also have some questions that are appropriate to other phases as well, but you can start to see a little bit of a, uh, a kind of concentration in that one particular phase. So we can move on to the next, an, a different part of the, the same worksheet. And again, there's, there's more to it than what we're going to see today. Um, we, we liked this idea of um, there's kind of a, a couple of different continuums for all of these different phases. So you ask the venture, you know, is this, do you feel like you're in a period of focusing and narrowing, or do you feel like you're in a period of exploring and broadening? 
Like what, what does it feel like right now in, term, in, in your business? Does it feel like an intentional moment of pause or does it feel like you're in constant motion? Does it feel like a lower momentum time? Does it feel like a higher momentum time? And based on where they are along those sliders, um, you can kind of choose which, which phase. So as you can see, this particular venture over the course of this worksheet has pretty solidly identified themselves in the navigating section. So once we've made that determination, um, you know, the next thing you can really do is go to the navigating section of the toolkit. You can read that through with the venture, see what resonates, um, or you could just jump to the next worksheet, which is, okay, say you're in the navigating phase, fantastic. Tell me a little bit about what you're doing from a measurement perspective and some of the things you're struggling with. And, you know, again, similar interactive checklist. Um, what are some things you've tried? Well, they've tried a couple things in column A, they've tried a couple things in column C, they've experienced some of these pitfalls. And um, over the course of this process, the evaluator who's helping facilitate this process might be able to see, huh, I see what's happening here. You've, you've self-identified that you're in a navigating phase. Most of the stuff you've tried is not a, a tool that's really appropriate for that phase. And you're struggling with a lot of the things that are, are kind of typical of that phase, or maybe some of those struggles are due to misalignment. So you've been able to kind of diagnose a misalignment here. So critically, the next step, once you've, found, you've uncovered that misalignment, we've got a script for the venture to be able to use with their investor. Um, we think our venture is in the navigating phase. What do you think? I feel that until we can answer questions about how our, in, our customers interact with our product, we're at risk of misunderstanding and misrepresenting the kind of impact it's creating. Answering questions about the product's long-term impact, like you would like us to do, is also important, but it's not as urgent. We need to understand this first. Um, there's more, more scripts um, in the guide as well, but you get a sense of how this actually can kind of help to facilitate that conversation. And then on the other side, ideally, you're also having conversations with the investor who hired you. Um, and that investor can also go through a parallel process. There's an investor worksheet where the investor themselves can actually think about, hmm, which phase is my, is this venture in, or are the majority of the ventures in my portfolio in? So they can kind of get a little bit of an education on, on these phases. And then we ask them the question, well, how aligned is the support you're providing and the kinds of IMM you're asking for? And you can see, well, okay, we have certain things that might be helpful to the navigating phase, but maybe we could do more. And that's really what can point them to, well, here are some really concrete ways you can support ventures in the navigating phase. And, you know, starting with like, let them measure the way they want to measure <laughs> or the way that it's going to be most appropriate. Even if you don't provide another dime for them to do it, just like give them a little bit of autonomy to do that, like with our blessing as evaluators. Um, so that gives you a little bit of a sense, you know, one use case of how you might jump around this toolkit as a um, as an evaluator. But I'll just give, you know, throw out a couple more examples where you might find this useful. One might be kind of one level up is maybe you're not working directly with the ventures, but you're really focused on working with the investors. They really want a very responsive, effective, value driving IMM approach. So you're helping them build out their systems, policies, and resources. And so really starting in the second half of the guide, which is all about how investors can help, um, is, is a great starting point, but also, you know, giving them a little education about these phases and um, what their ventures might be going through. Um, another case might just be helping a venture find the right IMM tool for the question at hand. Maybe it's not like this big power struggle and this misalignment challenge. Maybe they just really need the right tool and helping them identify their question and the right tool for the question is, um, is what you can use it for. And that is so familiar to us as evaluators, right? Like let's, let's figure out what the key evaluation question is first then we've come up with a method to answer that question. Um, it's actually quite in, it's like obvious to a lot of the folks in our community, but it's not common practice um, out in the market-based world currently. Um, and then finally, you know, sometimes the, the 
folks who are making demands or setting the expectations are funders or investors, but sometimes they're other folks. Sometimes it's the founder of the venture who has a certain idea of how IMM should be done. Sometimes it's a board member, um, someone else who's influential, who has you know, exerted a lot of influence over the way the venture is doing this, and they just need some, some advocacy support. So again, we are so curious to hear how you use some of these tools, but that's just, those are some ways that we thought might be helpful. Um, so at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to, uh, to Penny to lead us in a little bit of a, a kind of philosophical reflection about how, how we show up here as evaluators, and then um, hopefully open it up to a bit of a conversation with all of you. Thanks, Laura. Yeah, as Laura said, we're very keen to hear from you and, and leave enough time for, um, for that sort of Q&A part of the, this uh, webinar. So I'll, I'll run through this uh, fairly rapidly. So um, we, we were wanted to put something out there about how we think IMN practitioners can help, and then I'll move on to how evaluators can help, so making that distinction between people who are already working in the impact measurement and management space and uh, evaluators who may be interested in, in contributing to that. So as you've seen from the guide, um, IMM practitioners can support and facilitate optimizing of, of the choices that are made um, around IMM and measurement for ventures and for investors. So um, as in, in other sectors and as in uh, evaluation, the use of questions is really key to this. So asking, asking the right questions at the right time, which we've tried to um, sort of put within the guide and the worksheets, uh, the, those questions in the worksheets aren't exhausted, of, exhaustive, obviously, there's other questions that could be asked. But the idea is, is that using that kind of questioning inquiry approach to figure out what, what might be most useful at a particular point in time. So the, the more usual sort of evaluator type questions, what are the key questions, what are the information needs of the various um, interested parties here, and um, what working together to find out what might be used, most useful. We've talked about avoiding pitfalls. So that's, that's another um, thing that IMM practitioners can contribute to. And really being quite active in this space and um, influencing what gets done and when it gets done. So, so one pitfall that we came across, we've described as committing too early to a set of metrics or a particular measurement approach that is, becomes hard to change and actually can end up being quite harmful. And the misalignment of, met, of metrics that drive things in the wrong direction. So to the right information at the right time to enable decisions to be made to actually um, create impact and reduce risk of impact not happening. So, you know, there are, there are questions, there are, um, sorry, approaches that can be pretty helpful. Um, we've talked about theory of change. Theory of change, I think, is helpful if you use it in the right way. Um, but also, you know, how do, we, how do we actually support ventures and investors to make those choices um, early on and throughout the whole process of change? Um, so anyway, so move on to the next next one. So we 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 came up with this kind of um, reframing, looking at this. How does IMM need to be reframed? So on the on the left hand side there, we characterise a, a, a more traditional approach, which has probably come come out of the evaluation field, as IMM being a, a technical, uh, very measurement in a technical way oriented thing, looking at impact static as we heard from the case example you know holding things still while you measure them and linear um so theories of change tend to be linear but they don't have to be so so in a more kind of they can be a more sort of systems oriented type of theory of change that is more flexible uh, and captures change over time so so that's that's the, what we'd call the the sort of more technical static linear on the other hand what we think is needed going forward is much more strategic uh, approach to measurement, um, as we've described, uh, measurement that allows ventures to stay adaptive, that, that will change in order to um, drive impact, as we've talked about, and iterative. So, you know, if you look at the phases that we've described, these ebbs and flows happen, they, those ebbs and flows also happen in the measurement space. So sometimes you might need sophisticated, multidimensional, 
but sometimes it may be more feasible, practical and useful to, to use much simpler and direct measures and then back again. So the idea is, is that measurement is not one thing fixed at the beginning for all time, but it's, it's a flexible way of working. Next slide, thanks. So evaluators, so this is the evaluation, the American Evaluation Association. So um, we wanted to say something about how can evaluators help here? So um, this, is, this is largely a reflection that I've had. So, so having worked in for evaluation for a long time and then moving into this IMM um, investment space, this is a developing field and it's developing on parallel tracks with evaluation. So evaluation has a long history um, and, and a lot of useful things to contribute, knowledge, practice, et cetera, but, but really more convergent convergence between these two fields would be, I think, potentially very useful. Um, and it could help if, the, if that practice experience and wisdom is shared, then IMM practitioners who are perhaps new to this kind of work, would, we could, it could help to avoid some of the pitfalls that we've encountered and that, um, that don't necessarily have to happen if you're aware of them. So an example is, is a sort of methods driven approach as we've described earlier. Um, so this, this learning um, means that evaluators can, I believe, have value uh, or can add value to IMM through sharing the knowledge, uh, particularly about design methodology, but, but also practice, you know, what, what do we know about how this measurement um, stuff can work well. So, you know, there are obvious things like, you know, questions driven, not methods driven, etc. And there's, there's a lot more than that. But I think, I think there's a lot of value that could be added. So looking for opportunities to engage in the IMM field, um, if you get the opportunity to provide direct support to development of um, impact, impact measurement, implementation plans, et cetera. And so um, I'm hoping that this happens more and that there is this convergence and, and um, mutual sharing of experience, et cetera, that, that actually contributes to, in itself to driving impact. So we would, um, we will be, Laura and I will be at the conference in, in November. So we'd like to continue this conversation with those of you that are interested. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I think um, those conversations, we would like this kind of conversation to continue and, and to hear more about others' experiences. Um, and one key point that, that we're, we're making here is that it, IMM isn't just technical. So what we're working with here is, is the political, the power dynamics, the, the behavioral part of this, um, which all comes to play and has a bearing on what kind of measurement happens and whether or not it's useful. So, so the stakes are quite high there, I think. Um, so evaluators having worked on these kinds of things for some time, I think we can help to disrupt power dynamics, get, get uh, here we've taken a venture, approach to try and do that in terms of the power dynamic between investors and ventures, but there's other kinds of power dynamics that we can contribute to, to in, the, in the interest of better IMM practice. So um, now we do have, how long have we got? We've got 10 minutes, that's great. So this is our sort of reflection point where we'd like to hear from you. We, um, we have some questions that we, we haven't got answers to that really we're trying to provoke these kinds of discussions. So who decides how IMM is designed? So um, how does that happen? If we flip the script, uh, what, what implications are there there? How would that influence things? And particular interest probably for this group is what role can evaluators play? Um, I've outlined a few things, but of course this is a, this is a very broad field. So there's a, there's a lot of ways that evaluators can interact and we would like to see um, us as evaluators being more assertive, I guess, like rather than being sort of um, neutral observers from the side and making judgments on things, we think we have a role to actually get in there and, and be part of the change. So, so we've characterized that as our role being active rather than passive. Be good to hear what you think about that. Um, do we have responsibility? if we see things aren't going quite right. Um, and in a way that was one of the things that, that prompted this work. Um, is it part of our role to intervene, to advocate, to influence, to try and 
change a situation? Um, and how can we do that effectively? And how can we maintain our integrity and our values that we hold as professional evaluators um, and uh, practice ethically, I think I would characterize that as. So floor open, let's, um, let's have a conversation. And we know enough of you that we can start picking um, <laughs> names. Uh, so we'll, we'll <laughs> give another few seconds for some volunteers. Well, I see, um, I might call on Danielle, who just um, put something in the chat. I wonder if you'd be willing to make your point out loud, Danielle. Uh, Lara, Karen, Penny, thank you so much for this great presentation. I really enjoyed the report, the guide. It's amazing. But that's what I'm sharing with you. I'm, I may be a little bit pessimist, uh, pessimist, but it seems ahead of our time. You know, I don't see many entrepreneurs, ventures, uh, asset managers, investors asking, really seriously asking themselves about impact. You know, it's kind of just do the basics, just bring up a fear of change. Okay, and that's all about impact. That's all, that's all that we need, okay? So I just would like to hear about this overall comment that I'm bringing to you. Why don't I provide an initial remark? Thanks, Danielle. Um, and then Laura Penny, please jump in. I would say first, um, you're doing it. Therefore, hopefully there's a few more. So, you know, and you've been doing it for a long time. And in, in some of the ways that we describe it and many of the ways that were also ahead of their time. So the good news is that I was happy to use you as a case study for a long time. Um, and hopefully this prompts uh, a just a, a new set of actors that are either have been doing it in similar ways for a long time to be more visible um, or others who are just beginning their practice to essentially feel that this is the way it should be done. I think we're at a really interesting moment in time in the, and I'll speak maybe from the IMM and impact investing space. There's a lot of critique um, or questions right now around this concept of impact integrity and, and impact washing, greenwashing, et cetera. One potential response particularly with all the regulation and, and standards and practice is that we just end up measuring a lot more. And we already know that for many ventures, in a sense, there is fatigue around data collection and a lot of the contextual elements and, and the, the key questions, as we've said, that ventures want to try and, and respond to, they're not necessarily given the space and time and, and even enabling environment to be able to do. And so one potential challenge and inflection point we're at is that essentially that becomes worse because of, of essentially the downloading of all these demands and, and probably Danielle, you're seeing that and anyone who's working in a fund right now, um, you know, is, is probably feeling that as are their ventures. And so I think this last couple of questions was actually our, um, one of our reflections is that what is the role that, you know, it's not a simple question of just measure less. It's really about rethinking the way that measurement provides value and value for whom and value for what. Um, and so we hope that more groups are actually front loading some of that discussion. And we've tried to use the worksheet and the guides to essentially help them to do that. In a way, it just, just acknowledges it, it is imbalanced right now and it might be more imbalanced um, you know, with the demands, but there are better ways forward. And I, I think I'm quite encouraged that at least we've seen the, some of the initial response from family offices, for example, as one segment that have actually said, hey, this resonates with us because some of the issues that we've pointed to um, around um, some of the themes, you know, around equity, around what is the role of new actors, around different forms of capital, actually are questions we're grappling with. And so this is, this is exactly the kind of conversation we wanna have now. So I, I may be a little bit more of a <laughs> optimist um, than you, Danielle, but I truly take your point and, and Penny, um, Laura, any any reactions? Because I think this is such an important set of issues. I'll leave yeah, it there. No, I no, see no, that. Oh, no, go ahead, no. Penny. Yeah, no, I was just going to say thanks for your question, Daniel. It's great. I mean, I think um, I'm encouraged that you think it's ahead of time. <laughs> Hopefully, that that makes it useful um, 
you know, it, 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 we're usually behind the behind the the eight ball in evaluation. Everything happens, and then we comment on it. So, so um, I hope that makes it more useful. If you think it's um, it's something sort of to reach for, but Karim, I think you've responded fine to that question. Hey, Sasha, why don't you jump in, comment or question? Sure, I'm happy for others to jump in if they want as well. But um, first of all, thank you so much for a great presentation and a great guide. I think it's a it's a great kind of structure around the call for fit for pur fit for purpose measurement, which doesn't always happen. And actually, that's true for impact investing. That's actually true for international development and grants as well. Like, it's such maybe you guys could even like pivot this to <laughs> to more kind of nonprofit entities. Um, and, and obviously also better communication between investors and investees, whether, again, whether NGOs or, or social entrepreneurs, adventurers, et cetera. Um, I, I love the kind of the, the, the worksheets and the structuring around it. I wonder, and this has been, I feel like mentioned already a couple of times, like how much resourcing has to do with it in impact investing, where you feel like you have to measure a lot, but actually you're given very, very few resources. Um, kind of if we, you know, if we're in, investing in a venture and they don't have a, a finance manager, you'd probably think twice and be like, okay, do we need to put one on, one in? Whereas with a kind of an impact manager, that's not necessarily a role that's immediately considered. So how do we kind of shape the conversation both with this guide and with the conversations that we're having, but also with trying to, to think about how do we finance impact uh, or how do we resource the impact side and what are kind of the options there? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question, Sasha, and I don't think we have a complete answer to it here. I think the places we do touch on it, one are in the specific recommendations of what investors can do. If we're, if we're framing IMM guidance and support as one avenue for investor contribution, and investors are thinking about that, they're thinking about what is my con contribution to impact. If that's one avenue for contribution, then like, what does good look like there? Um, and some of that looks like, you know, we, we, in that little um, schema, we, we talked about, you know, providing gear and guides, like actual resources to do it is, um, is one possible way to do it. Um, but I think beyond that, I think there is an, a right sizing element here in the guide as well of like don't don't measure as if you're in five different phases at once right don't take on every single you know don't don't use every framework just because it exists and somebody recommended it at one point like use the framework and the tool that is right for the moment and not the ones that are wrong for the moment so you don't just have to like keep piling on new ones and new ones which i think oftentimes it feels that way as a venture or an investor navigating the space it's just like oh, there's a new tool every day and i just have to keep adding them all on and i think what we're sort of arguing here is like don't do them all do one at a time or do you know, do just the ones that are right and not the ones that are wrong, which I think keeps the resourcing question a little bit more reasonable. Obviously, we're, you know, fighting against a, a lot of other dynamics of um, where other kinds of metrics are being required for, for other reasons as well. But I think what we're arguing for is right tool, right time. And I'll just add very quickly there, I think the key there is in the acronym IMM. So the other thing that we're we're, we're advocating for is that this is not an add-on. This is part of good management. So it should be integral to, to everybody's job. Uh, 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 noting that, of course, the capacity needs to be developed, but it's not a separate thing. So I um, don't know if that answers the resource question, but it's it's a way of thinking about it. Yeah, and I see we're at time, um, but yeah. you know, we uh, just as as a kind of final kind of call to action. This is meant to be for, for us. Um, and, and it was our best attempt to compile what we have seen, heard, and try to translate that into a set of guidance and tools that, that really people like us would be able to use and kind of take forward to ask some of these questions, including the one around resourcing, because the question around what is appropriate resourcing and who decides is such a loaded question right now. And the way it's being answered today, as you said, Sasha, is insufficient um, at best. Um, so we would love to hear and continue this conversation and tell us how you're using the worksheets, what parts are helpful, what is missing, what else do we need? Because this came out of an effort um, that was really self-organized and we're, we're totally open around where it goes and, and how to build it and kind of build on top of it with all of you.
Um, this is partly the, the role of this community of practice. And so please feel free to reach out to us anytime um, with your comments, feedback, kind of questions and suggestions. And collectively, I think even at the TIG level to decide how we can um, advance the broader conversation around, you know, what does better IMM look like? With well, that, maybe you. I will close. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much, Sasha. I mean, thank you so much, Laura, Penny, and um, Karim. It was a really helpful session, and I know our members are going to enjoy revisiting it on our YouTube uh, channel as well.